On behalf of the Harbour Club of the United Kingdom, welcome to tonight's presentation by Professor Thomas Dietrich. I'm Victoria Leung, member of the board and events chair of the Harvard Club. Our club is an umbrella organization for college graduates and alumni from all the Harvard graduate schools. This event is a collaboration with the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and a shared interest group in healthcare. Special thanks to Dr. Stefan Serban for making all this possible. The talk was originally scheduled as a live event way back in March, but we had to cancel due to the lockdown. And the upside of this Zoom format is that many more of you are able to participate. Thank you, Dr. David Rogers and Marielle Boudreau, for public health for facilitating the technical side. After the presentation, Thomas will answer some of your questions. Some of you have already submitted questions to us and we will answer some of those. Please post your questions as you go along by using the Zoom chat feature at any time. I'll now turn it over to Stefan. Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Stefan Serban. I'm a specialist trainee in dental public health at Public Health England and I'm serving as the chair of the shared interest group in healthcare of Harvard Club UK. It is my great privilege to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Thomas Dietrich. Professor Dietrich graduated both dentistry and medicine at Charité Humboldt University in Berlin and completed his master's degree in public health at Harvard School of Public Health. Currently, he's professor of oral surgery at the University of Birmingham. Professor Dietrich's research focuses on clinical and epidemiological research on the determinants of oral diseases and their interactions with systemic diseases, in particular cardiovascular and rheumatic disease. He has received grants from numerous prestigious institutions, such as the National Institute of Health in the United States, the National Institute of Health Research in the UK, and the European Union. Without further ado, Professor Dietrich. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for the kind introduction. And thank you very much uh, to the Harvard Club for um, inviting me to give this uh, talk. It's a uh, it's a great pleasure and I, I, can, I can agree that Zoom is a great feature and we have an international audience, which is just fantastic. Um, you have, some of you have uh, submitted some questions um, uh, with the registration. Uh, only a few of those related to the actual topic of the, of the talk. So I will um, address those as I go along, as you will see. Um, I will start to share my screen, hold on a second, and you should now see hopefully the first slide, which is the title slide, <clears throat> floss or die, gum disease, tooth loss, and their effects on general health. And the first question from the audience um, was, uh, that relates to the talk, is what stimulated your personal interest in this topic? Um, uh, the, the topic of the connection between oral and systemic health. And I suspect um, it was a perfect, sto a perfect storm in many ways. Um, obviously, you heard from Stefan that I was silly enough to go to both dental school and medical school. Uh, so, it, you know, in some ways, it was natural for me to, um, you know, to study those links, uh, I, which is quite untypical, the dentistry first. Uh, so by the time I then had finished uh, medical school, um, you know, this I, I had already developed uh, an interest in that uh, in that specific topic, but also it was uh, you know the timing, I guess. Um, 1989, I lived in Berlin. I had lived in Berlin all my life, and uh, you may remember that the Berlin Wall came down in 1989. So that was what what grabbed my attention, uh, and uh, at that time. But uh, the other things that happened was, was that two papers were published by Scandinavian researchers. In those days, um, there was actually a theory that was quite popular that chlamydia, infection with chlamydia, was a, a novel risk factor, a novel cause that was discovered for cardiovascular disease. And then people were quick enough to think, and, and that was, came out of Scandinavia. And then other groups in Scandinavia thought, well, what about dental infections? And, uh, and so what they, uh, in the first papers, as you can see, a BMJ, not, you know, pretty good medical journal, uh, published this paper on an association between dental health and acute myocardial infarction. And then there was another one 
in the same year on um, strokes effectively. Now, what you have to understand that that um, notion, that possibility that oral infections or oral health conditions, and in particular gum disease, um, could cause uh, heart disease or strokes or atherosclerosis, um, that caused a lot of excitement in the dental field. Um, for obvious reasons. I mean, all of a sudden, uh, dentistry came back into the body, so to speak. The mouth came back into the body. For dentists, you know, that was very exciting, in particular for academic dentists, um, uh, because all this, you know, new field of exciting research all of a sudden uh, popped up. And so in 1997, I'm sorry to say the title of this, uh, of this lecture, I didn't come up with it, uh, 1997, there was a, a conference in, in North Carolina. Um, uh, a few more papers had appeared, uh, and all of a sudden, that was a really, really big and interesting uh, uh, topic, in particularly in periodontal research, so in, in, in dental research. And my former boss, my boss at Boston University, where I went uh, after I graduated from HSPH, Himself, a Harvard graduate, um, uh, uh, Raul Garcia, uh, who is still at. Uh, the, guys, could you switch? Uh, could you mute your yourself, please? Um, he uh, he coined those um, those words. He playfully flipped aside uh, uh, here, um, uh, you know, suggesting gum disease kills, you know, close or die. Um, this is Raul, those are his words. Now, clearly that wasn't, uh, that was slightly tongue in cheek, if you like. Um, but uh, as I said, that tr triggered a lot of interest. And back to me personally, my own interest, and really the reason why I ended up at HSPH doing a, a master's uh, at, uh, at the Harvard School of Public Health, um, is linked to this as well, because um, I quickly realized that uh, very few people in dentistry um, knew very much about what was going on in terms of uh, epidemiology and epidemiologic research. So I, I thought, okay, I want to understand these papers. Uh, there's clearly something uh, that uh, needs to be done here and that caused me to go to Harvard. So uh, that answers that question, hopefully. Okay, I will start by, because I realized that, um, you know, the vast majority of you won't be uh, uh, dentists uh, and, uh, and, and po probably not even medics. So um, I will start by quickly explaining what gum disease or periodontitis uh, actually is. Um, so on the left here, you can see, or you can see a tooth and you can see the so-called periodontium. Periodontium is made up of um, something called the periodontal ligament here. You can see the gingiva here and some epithelium. And clearly there is bone here, which uh, forms the tooth sockets, socket, which holds the tooth in place via these you know, little fibers that make up the periodontal ligament. Now in health here on the left side of the slide, um, you have um, you know, a very thin epithelium uh, that's just uh, uh, lining here. The, uh, that makes up that connection between the tooth and the, and the gingiva, uh, and the gum tissue effectively. Oops, hold on. And, um, uh, and these are these famous probes that dentists use. So uh, as periodontists, we use a blunt probe um, to essentially check how deep we can uh, insert it into this, what we call the sulcus. And if we can ins insert it no more than three millimeters, most often in healthy conditions, it's, you know, we can just do one millimeter, maybe two millimeters, but three is considered the maximum that is sort of consistent with health. Um, then, you know, we consider that a healthy periodontium, provided that none of this bone uh, has been lost already. Now, what happens now is that obviously we have plaque, or you, I'm sure you're aware that we have plaque bacteria uh, accumulating on the tooth surface here. And so uh, that those bacteria, they trigger an immune reaction by the body. And so immune cells uh, in the gingiva will uh, 
uh, you know, will uh, accumulate there and will mount uh, a defense. Now, the problem with that immune response is that um, it cannot really be successful because it cannot get rid of the bacteria that accumulate on the tooth because the tooth is a, is a, is a hard surface and the biofilm that accumulates on it really cannot be um, removed by the immune system. It has to be moved by yourselves via toothbrush or a similar mechanical intervention. Now, in some patients, those that are susceptible to uh, uh, periodontitis, and not every patient is susceptible to periodontitis, so you may find patients that have fairly poor oral hygiene, actually, but they do not get uh, periodontitis. But in those who are susceptible to it, that immune response that uh, develops here in that gingival tissue um, is, if you like, dysregulated. Uh, it's a very strong uh, uh, response to those uh, bacteria and the plaque. And as a result of that strong immune response on the inflammatory mediators that get released locally here, the bone gets uh, resorbed. So that disappears. And what happens because of that, not just the bone disappears, the periodontal ligament as well disappears. And what happens is that that pocket develops and that pocket gets deeper and deeper and deeper over time until eventually, if you don't do anything, uh, or the bone will have gone, the tooth becomes mobile and ultimately will fall out. So that's sort of the short introduction into what periodontitis actually is. Now, in the context of today's topic, I think we can ask ourselves four distinct questions. Um, the first one, and they are sort of hierarchical. Um, so the first question is, you know, do patients with gum disease periodontitis have a higher risk of certain systemic disease? Um, if so, does this association exist independent of established risk factors? And um, I can already reveal that the answer to those first two questions is a yes. Uh, otherwise, my talk would be fairly short. Um, so if so, then the question is, is there evidence for causality of periodontitis? So is periodontitis actually causing um, uh, those systemic diseases? Or, you know, do they simply co-occur because of some um, other things going on? And I will talk quite a bit about that. And finally, then the question that would, uh, you know, result from that is, uh, if that's the case, then, you know, does this mean that the prevention of periodontitis and or the treatment of periodontitis in patients who are affected by the disease, you know, can that treatment, can periodontal treatment prevent, modify, um, uh, systemic diseases or affect um, the cause of those diseases. So, and uh, I will go through these points and hopefully illustrate, give you some answers, but also illustrate why, why answering in particular the third and the fourth question uh, is incredibly difficult and why, you know, it's a little bit elusive um, like a, a solution to the COVID-19 uh, problem at the moment. So, and by the way, periodontitis has been associated with, you know, almost every chronic uh, systemic disease uh, that known to mankind. I will focus here on largely on cardiovascular disease, on uh, adverse um, birth outcomes, so pregnancy outcomes, and, uh, and diabetes, because uh, those are, uh, to some extent, they are the best research ones, uh, and, uh, and also um, they are well suited to explain some of the points that I want to make. So uh, how do we answer that first question? How has our first question been answered um, about the association between periodontitis and, and uh, in this case here, coronary heart disease as an example? Now, typically how you would do this is you would assess that in what's called observational studies. For example, a cohort study. Uh, what does that mean? Um, well, you would collect a large group of uh, individuals. Uh, you would measure whether or not they have periodontitis. Um, in the simplest case, you would just, you know, uh, say yes or no, they do have periodontitis, they are exposed, as the epidemiologist would call it, and then you would follow them up over many years, and um, 
assess when they develop, if and when they develop um, coronary heart disease, cardiovascular disease, and stroke, whatever you're interested in. Now, the first problem with that is already that clearly you have to wait a long time and so be to, for these outcomes to develop. And so when this topic came up back in you know, the late 90s, um, uh, for the most part, the uh, researchers had to rely on data that were already collected. And um, there is a general problem with um, observational studies of this kind, and I will discuss that in a bit more detail, and that is that they are all, all susceptible to confounding. I'll explain a bit more what we mean by that, but they, we struggle to make, uh, to draw direct causal conclusions, typically, from uh, observational studies. Now, in the context of the periodontitis as an exposure, there are some particular challenges, and there have been some particular challenges, um, uh, some of which are listed here. So to start with, most large-scale cohort studies that exist, um, I, I'd say actually almost all of them, uh, lack oral health assessments. Um, some of them may have uh, self-report, uh, so they may have, you know, asked the patients, or they may question they have, have may have been sent out to participants at some point. You know, how is your oral health? Do you have periodontitis, etc. But these questions and these assessments um, are, and, and I've done quite a bit of work on that, and we try to validate those. Um, but they, they are notorious for their limited validity. So it's really unclear what they measure, and therefore they are of limited use in, in these uh, observational epidemiologic studies. Another issue that rarely uh, do you get repeat assessments of the exposure, uh, but most studies simply don't have any oral health assessments. And a prime example is the famous Framingham study, which um, you know is, uh, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of, uh, a study that started uh, long before I was born in, in Massachusetts. Um, and, uh, and, and that's uh, still true for most medical cohort studies uh, these days, because you know, investigators will be reluctant, any investigator will be, will be reluctant to, uh, to let a dentist near uh, their patients because they need to have happy participants. And, um, uh, and, and so you know, it's not popular, let's put it that way. Uh, is also very costly. It takes typically a lot of time. Uh, and so uh, from that perspective, the evidence base is, uh, is a bit limited, unfortunately. So we know a lot more about other risk factors, uh, you know, uh, lipid levels, et cetera, et cetera, than we know about um, oral health. Having said that, um, 10 years into the story now, let's say, so 10 years after Floss or Die was, uh, appeared in that newspaper article, um, it became pretty clear that the answer to that first question is a, is a fairly resounding yes. So there is people who have periodontitis uh, do suffer more from, uh, in this case, cardiovascular disease or atherosclerotic vascular disease. They have more atherosclerosis and they have more complications from those. This is a typical way of, uh, summarizing you know various studies you can see here the uh, the authors of these studies that's a so-called forest plot the relative risk of one year which is uh, this line uh, represents what we call a null association so there's no increased risk uh, among the exposed compared to the unexposed so comparing those with versus without periodontitis and you can see that the results of most of these studies here are on the right side of this line so in almost all of these, bar one uh, study that were included in this particular uh, review here, uh, the, the, the investigators saw an increased risk uh, of uh, coronary heart disease amongst uh, those participants that had periodontitis compared to those that didn't have periodontitis. And if you want to you know, calculate an overall grant mean, if you like an overall average, then this comes up at here as 1.34. Now it's very debatable whether it, it's meaningful to, 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 to calculate these, these grand means, but you know, this would be interpreted as uh, a 1.3 times, a, a, a patient with periodontitis as a 1.3 times the risk of a heart uh, disease compared to someone with no periodontitis or 30% increase in, or 34% increase here um, in, in that risk. <clears throat> 
And now if you, <clears throat> if you ask yourself, well, okay, you, you can see these associations, how meaningful is that? How, how strong is that compared to perhaps um, risk factors that are more established? So this is a small piece of work that we did here using some, uh, that my colleague Praveen Sharma here in Birmingham did, uh, using uh, data from the US from a large um, uh, representative survey that was conducted between, you know, here the late 80s and early 90s. And then these patients were, uh, the mortality of these patients was then followed up uh, uh, using the National Death Index. And uh, so you can see we have here, you know, over 15 years of follow-up. And, and this is patients that, uh, uh, are, that have chronic kidney disease. So it's not the entire cohort, it's just uh, patients with kidney disease. And amongst patients with kidney disease, you can see their mortality is relatively high. Um, so, you know, 30%, uh, over 30% here uh, are no longer alive after 10 years. Um, and, uh, but these are patients that have chronic kidney disease, but they don't have diabetes and they don't have uh, parentitis. Now, if you look at the mortality uh, amongst patients who have parentitis, in addition to their uh, chronic kidney disease, you can see that their mortality is considerably higher. Now, if we look at those that are parentally healthy but have diabetes in addition to their chronic kidney disease, then you can see that the effect, if you like, and I use that word cautiously, but the effect of uh, parentitis is roughly the same as that of diabetes. So, and if they have both uh, uh, parentitis and diabetes, you can see that the mortality is even higher. So, I would argue that you know, the associations that we see in those, in those epidemiologic studies are potentially meaningful if they are indeed causal, um, uh, and if indeed uh, parentitis causes these uh, ad adverse outcomes. Which uh, leads me to the second question that was related to the topic uh, uh, of uh, today's talk, and that is uh, some of uh, one of you asked uh, as an alternative to the seemingly causal link presented in the advertisement, uh, could this be a manifestation? So that obviously refers to floss or die. Uh, could this be a manifestation of inadequate concern by patients about their overall health? Um, and uh, meaning, you know, gum disease is correlated with heart disease due to underlying neglect. Uh, and, and as well as to oral health and, you know, it's not a cause. That's a very good question. And in fact, um, uh, obviously that's a key question that we're trying to answer um, using various uh, epidemiologic techniques. And I'm gonna cover that. So let's think about this for a moment. What could explain this association? Now, the first possible explanation is that chronic parentitis, which is here, uh, uh, is directly or indirectly, so via some mediators, but has, di has direct causal effects on coronary heart disease. So this is our outcome of interest here. This is our exposure. And the question we want to answer, and that's what it's all about, is, you know, is indeed chronic parentitis a cause of co uh, coronary heart disease? There are different mechanisms that can be discussed. Uh, through which chronic parentitis acts on coronary heart disease, but that's essentially the causal question, oops, sorry, essentially the causal questions that we're interested in. But as uh, one of you uh, has noted, well, there may be other reasons that explain in associations that you see in these uh, epi studies, in these cohort studies. And indeed the first question or the second question I, I uh, put to you was, well, what about what we call established cardi coronary, uh, cardiovascular risk factors, such as diabetes, such as smoking? You know, do they confound this association? Uh, could they explain this association? And what you see here is a causal diagram where the arrows mean a causal effect, um, which is directed. And, uh, and any factor that is causing, causing both the exposure and the outcome of interest, that's a general rule. So any factor in our case that causes chronic parentitis and at the same time as a risk factor, a causal risk factor for uh, the outcome we're interested in, coronary heart disease in this case, uh, that would confound this association. So what does that mean? It means that if we ignore this factor, we ignore this factor, smoking, diabetes, et cetera, 
we will see an association, but that association is not necessarily a causal association. It will be biased, it will be confounded by these factors. So this is what we call the structural nature, if you like, of, uh, of confounding or the structure of confounding. So common risk factors are a problem. Now, how can we address them? Well, we can address those in, in clinical research in, in two major ways. One way is that we somehow account for them in the data analysis or in the design of our observational study. For example, um, we could um, limit our study to patients without diabetes. If we don't have any diabetics in our study, then diabetes cannot confound, cannot be a confounder. If we only have never smokers in our study, then smoking cannot be a confounder of, uh, of the relationship uh, that we want to study. Uh, that's one way. And the other way is to um, adjust for it uh, in, and there are different ways of doing this, but effectively account for uh, the different uh, smoking levels, the different uh, diabetes levels in the data analysis. There are very effective statistical tools to do that. But the big but is you have to measure those confounding factors uh, in your study. So you have to ask pa patients, uh, people, what they, you know, about their smoking habits and their smoking history. And you need to somehow determine whether or not they uh, have diabetes. And, you know, smoking, yes, no, may not be good enough. You may need to collect much more detailed data. Uh, diabetes, yes, no, may not be good enough. You may have to collect much more detailed data on control of diabetes, for example, duration, et cetera, et cetera. The key issue is here, you need to be aware of potential, uh, of potential confounders so that you can then measure them and therefore uh, either, you know, adjust for them in your analysis or um, you know, uh, uh, account for them in the design of your study. Now, you may have realized already that there is a problem, a potential problem, and the potential problem is that you know, we may not know uh, all the common risk factors that uh, uh, underpin both chronic parentitis and coronary heart disease. And I've just you know, come up with this construct here, which I call pro-inflammatory susceptibility. And what I mean by that is just, something that uh, uh, in your immune response, in your host response, that makes you more susceptible to get parodontitis. Um, that's what I uh, discussed already. It's very important in the case of parodontitis. And um, uh, that also makes you more susceptible to coronary heart disease. Now, it's not difficult to think about that that is a plausible um, uh, possibility because both chronic parodontitis and coronary heart disease are chronic inflammatory diseases. So, and the many uh, factors, uh, molecules, enzymes, et cetera, that you know, play a role in inflammatory pathways, all of these could in theory, uh, or many of these could uh, be common risk factors for chronic parodontitis as well as coronary heart disease. And, as the question uh, and behavioral factors are other factors. So I put a neglect here because that's what the uh, uh, one of you has highlighted as a potential confounder. Uh, and neglect would be another option um, that, uh, you know, you could, uh, that could lead to chronic parodontitis as well as coronary heart disease. And yeah, we may be, oh, I mean, it's a plausible hypothesis. The question then is in an epi study, how would you measure this? How would you uh, operationalize this? to then be able to uh, you know, account for it in your design or in the data analysis. And so therefore, all of these observational studies are what we call susceptible to confounding because um, we may have unknown uh, factors or we may not be able to measure them um, uh, with high accuracy. Okay, let's focus for a moment on this potential uh, causal relationship here, or pathogens causing chronic parodontitis and then that causing uh, coronary heart disease. Uh, I said already all pathogens is, is one cause of chronic parodontitis and then host factors is another cause of parodontitis. Um, but the all pathogens uh, play probably a, uh, an important role in the putative uh, mechanisms. 
Now, uh, I apologize to the non-dentist for, uh, for this picture, but that, you know, may be what you see when you see a colonitis patient for the first time. You can probably see that it's not the cleanest mouth, mouth. Um, but otherwise it may not look particularly um, abnormal for, uh, for uh, the untrained eye. And, uh, and the same is true for a dentist, actually. So a dentist to diagnose periodontitis or to exclude periodontitis would always use that probe that I described and, and, and showed earlier. And then we record these probing depth here uh, at six sites per tooth, typically sometimes even 10 times per tooth. So you can see uh, the dentist would sort of record this and write down these numbers. And you, know, you can see it's an awful lot of data that are recorded. And uh, I guess that's why we charge so much money for this. And then in the end, uh, we typically, if then we think that is a periodontitis uh, case, then we take x-rays and what you can see is here a complete uh, 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 radiographic status, as we call this. And uh, if you just look here, for example, on the upper left side, you know, you can see a bit of this, this, this bubble here that comes out that, oops, that is some uh, concrement there, some, some calculus. Uh, and you can see that normally the bone level would be expected to be approximately here, but the bone actually is resorbed and now the bone, uh, the alveolar support uh, ends here. So there's quite a bit of bone loss. I you know, estimate 50% of the bony support roughly of this tooth or more than 50% uh, have been lost in this case. And clearly you can imagine if this continues, that tooth would fall out. So what do these pockets look like? Uh, and this is a histologic slide here uh, uh, and a cross section through a tooth here on the left side. So this is the root surface of a tooth. And then here you can see the, the gingiva. Um, this is the epithelium on the outside of the gingiva. So that's where your toothbrush, that's what you would look at, what you see. And this is the pocket that's typically hidden that we would probe with that uh, periodontal probe. And you can see there are some dirt here on that root surface, some calculus, and not only calculus, there is actually some biofilm on that. So there's these bacteria, which is a very thick, gluey kind of uh, covering, uh, uh, which is this biofilm, so a mix of various bacteria. The deeper you go into the pocket, the more likely you have, you have really bad bacteria that uh, you know, have released lots of toxins that don't like oxygen and are therefore uh, particularly patho, uh, pathogenic uh, to, the, to the host. And if you look at this uh, gingiva here, and you can see there's a lot, I mean, you may not know, but trust me, this is not what a healthy epithelium looks like. Looks like. What's going on here is there is quite a bit of inflammation in here. These are all these dark blue uh, cells that have infiltrated uh, this tissue. And you have to believe me, that uh, there is ulceration here. So this is actually a big ulcer on the inside. And so because you have these bacteria that are in direct contact with this ulceration, um, which is effectively an open wound, um, that's really where we think uh, that, that, that can, so the exposure to this chronic inflammation in the tissue, but also the exposure to the toxins and the pathogens here uh, through this open wound, that could have uh, systemic uh, consequences. Now, how big is this wound, you might want to might ask. And so people have done some measurements and in a patient that, you know, pretty much has all his or her teeth left and has fairly severe uh, gum disease, as is the case in this patient, then roughly this wound area equals uh, uh, the area of the palm of the hand. Yeah? So just to give you an idea of how big, you know, the chronic wound is that is exposed to all these uh, pathogens, uh, that people have in their mouth. So, uh, you know, the areoles ulceration is then, you know, colonized by lots of bugs. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so it is plausible that that causes some problems. Now, here is another case where clearly uh, that patient has received some treatment by the looks of it already. You can see that, you know, the gum has receded here. So maybe the pockets are reduced a little bit. But also in particular, and that's important to keep in mind when we think about these epidemiologic studies and also the trials later on, um, as people lose teeth, they obviously reduce their wound area as well. And finally, you know, you have uh, edentulous patients, they've lost all their teeth, 
the periodontal treatment has been unsuccessful if they received any, um, but clearly they don't have any wound anymore. So if your dentulus from a systemic health uh, uh, impact in terms of the periodontal exposure, that's a perfect therapy if you like. And then, you know, you can come up with, uh, once you've established that there are these, and there's good evidence that you have repeated uh, bacteremias in, in patients that have periodontitis, uh, and now once they enter the bloodstream and these uh, inflammatory molecules enter the bloodstream, you can come up with lots of plausible hypotheses why um, you know, that may damage the endothelium, may damage the, the walls of the vessels, and, and therefore then lead to atherosclerosis. Um, so for example, these bugs can invade uh, endothelial cells. This is my colleague Clemens Walter here who did his PhD back in Berlin. Uh, he's now in Basel and he could convince in his PhD an endothelial cell to, uh, or a bacterium to invade an endothelial cell and take a picture of it. Uh, there are other mechanisms then that, you know, contribute to, uh, to the thickening of the arterial wall and ultimately to a rupture of these atherosclerotic plaques, which then lead to cardiovascular events such as a stroke or, uh, uh, or a heart attack. Um, <clears throat> now, the problem with these, uh, with these uh, biologically plausible mechanisms, uh, to some extent, is that, well, you can find a lot of evidence for this in, in vitro experiments and so forth, but what's very difficult is to prove or show that they actually play a role in real life. So, you know, a lot of this evidence on these, on, on, on these graphs here comes from in vitro experiments, comes from stuff that was done in Petri dishes, you know, comes from animal experiments. And obviously if I inject some periodontal pathogens into a mouse, um, you know, then yeah, you would expect that vasculature to show uh, some reaction. But that doesn't necessarily mean that in real life, uh, you know, where we're not being injected with these in large doses, that, that, that has a massive effect. So I would always caution you against sort of these biologic plausible mechanisms a little bit. And so I just briefly share um, uh, what I always you know, show, show my students when it comes to biologically plausible mechanisms. So this is, and this is true, unfortunately, uh, was the, the trajectory of my personal BMI here between 2005 and 2011. I, I have since uh, intervened and the situation has improved, but you can see that uh, during those years, I was gradually moving from, you know, a comfortable overweight to uh, something that um, most people would call uh, obesity. Um, and uh, at the same time, I, um, you know, I, uh, my, my, daughter, my first daughter was born at the end of 2004, born in Boston, the Brigham. And, and obviously, as a Harvard-educated uh, uh, academic clinician, I noticed that there was an association between her uh, height uh, you know, as she grew, uh, uh, I got fatter. And so uh, being, a, again, a Harvard-educated uh, clinical academic, I thought I need to see if that's reproducible. And so my second daughter was born at the end of 2005, and lo and behold, uh, I could see the same association. Now, is there a biological plausible mechanism is what you then ask yourself. And, uh, and sure there is, because as the girl's height increases, uh, mom's feeding increases, that increases the amount of leftovers and that then has a causal effect on my BMI. So really the message of the story here is, um, I think a, a creative uh, scientist can always come up with a biologically plausible mechanism. Uh, the proof is put in the pudding ultimately. Um, you, know, you know, can you find clinical evidence uh, for, uh, for these um, um, causal links? So I will speed up a little bit because I know it's we're quite late here already and I want to talk about the trials a bit more. But um, there is actually some evidence in the uh, observational studies that I think is more consistent with, uh, let's say, a non-causal association uh, than, or at least would point towards that uh, um, at least a large part of the association we see in the in the observational studies may be non-causal. Um, and one of these is, for example, that issue that tooth loss is a natural experiment. Uh, it's in some ways the most radical periodontal therapy. So clearly there's no chronic wound anymore in your mouth once you've lost all your teeth. And so very briefly, I'm just gonna show uh, these data. This is also data from, from Boston, uh, from the VA, 
normative aging and lo uh, dental longitudinal study that um, um, I was involved, I was fortunate enough to be involved in. Uh, Raul Garcia is the PI of this. And what we did is we looked at, uh, at these men and we found the men, men younger, uh, younger 60 at baseline and uh, we looked at their bone loss levels. Yeah, so this is increasing bone loss levels here. Those who are effectively periodontally healthy are the reference group. And then you can see these relative risks here. And uh, those who uh, were in the highest category at the most bone loss, the most severe history of periodontitis, uh, they were more than two times as likely to um, uh, suffer a cardiovascular event, a coronary heart disease event. So a angina or a heart attack or to die from a heart attack. But a bit disturbingly perhaps, um, if you look at those who had lost all their teeth, well, losing all their teeth didn't reduce their risk very much. They're still more likely here to have those cardiovascular events than those in the lower periodontal disease category. It's slightly lower, but you know, roughly in the, same, in the same range. Now, if you look at biomarkers, something like in this case here, serum, C-reactive protein, C-reactive protein being a blood marker of inflammation, which is extremely sensitive. The body reacts to any infection very quickly by releasing lots of the, this stuff in the blood. And so it's a surrogate marker for uh, coronary heart disease as well, cardiovascular disease. So if you have chronically slightly uh, increased levels of this, um, of this uh, biomarker, then you have a you know, higher rate of heart disease, et cetera. So people, including us here, started looking at the association between uh, periodontitis and this marker. And yeah, we can see that there is an association and the higher, the more, uh, the more severe your periodontitis is, the higher your level of C-reactive protein in the blood is. But those who had lost all their teeth had the highest levels of this inflammatory markers. So you mark us. So again, you wonder, you know, can you really attribute a causal interpretation uh, to uh, this association here? And then similar results uh, using other uh, methods. So uh, to summarize this, perhaps that uh, I think that uh, we can say that the established cardiovascular risk factors do not explain this association. I mean, we've seen this again and again and again with various uh, levels of adjustments and control for these established risk factors. So they don't explain the association. Um, uh, having said that, that doesn't mean that it's causal because there is uh, you know, the possibility that other risk factors, including that neglect that was mentioned, um, you know, can uh, still be behind those uh, associations. Now, the other uh, mechanism, the other uh, methodologic tool we have to avoid confounding uh, bias is to randomize. But the problem obviously is that we can randomize only interventions. So we can only do something and don't do something to certain groups of patients and, you know, leave the decision uh, uh, to whom we uh, give the intervention and whom we uh, don't give the intervention to uh, leave that to chance. So that would be randomization. Randomization makes sure that both groups uh, are uh, absolutely comparable in every aspect, whether we know about it or not. They are 100% comparable, provided that the study is large enough because you know, randomization works, it's magic. Um, with the one exception, and that's the intervention. So therefore we know for sure that if we see a difference after a while, that uh, you know, that has to be due to the difference in the intervention we allocated to half of the population uh, and not to the other half of the population. Again, when we look at uh, our problem, uh, you know, parodontitis, we have several fairly unique problems. I mean, RCTs are all randomized controlled trials, that is RCTs, they're always difficult and they're always expensive. Um, but uh, I would say, well, they're particularly difficult perhaps in, in, in our field. Uh, they may be considered particularly expensive perhaps. And some of them, uh, or a lot of it, is even not feasible. I mean, one example, for example, is that um, uh, you cannot randomize periodontitis. So the question whether or not periodontitis itself um, is, uh, is causally related, we cannot answer with a trial because we cannot randomize that exposure. But what we can do is we can treat patients that have periodontitis and we cannot treat the other half of those. Or can we, 
So clearly there is an ethical challenge if we want to do this because you know, we need a control arm, a non-treatment group, and uh, as a bit of a problem, right? We diagnose a disease, we say, okay, you have periodontitis, and then we say, but now we flip the coin, and I'm sorry, you know, you're not gonna get any treatment. So that's a bit of an issue. Um, another issue is, and that is linked to this problem of follow-up, is that what we can do quite nicely because we can delay periodontal treatment, so we can randomize some to immediate treatment and some to delayed treatment and just say, okay, well, you get your period treatment, but you get it in a year from now, which, you know, doesn't do too much damage. Um, but that limits us in terms of the outcomes we can look at. We certainly cannot look at heart attacks in the future or um, other what's called hard endpoints. We're limiting ourselves here to what's called surrogate endpoints, for example, biomarkers. Okay. Big paper published in 2007 in the New England Journal of Medicine out of London, treatment of periodontitis. So they did just what I just described a, a minute ago, which was, um, you know, randomize uh, patients to periodontitis, uh, uh, with periodontitis to either periodont treatment or a control treatment, which for now you can consider for simplicity as, as no treatment. And, uh, and they saw the following. So they did the baseline, they were obviously uh, comparable to groups because they were randomized. And then they measured here what's called flow mediated dilation, which is a functional assay of uh, a vessel in the, in the forearm uh, and which is considered a good marker of cardiovascular risk. And so what you can see is that on day one here, you get a deterioration in this response. So actually it's harmful on day one, which then recovers. And then over time, one month, two months, six months follow up as the periodontal uh, inflammation resolves because that needs healing after you treat it, um, you can actually see that these patients are better off in terms of uh, this uh, marker of cardiovascular risk. And this was considered at the time significant enough to make it into the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the top journal in medicine um, uh, globally. Uh, similar uh, results with other markers of inflammation, which are considered cardiovascular risk factors, but not with some. Here's this famous C-reactive protein again, and you can see you get a spike uh, through the treatment uh, because there's massive bacteremia when, you, when, when the dentist uh, goes into these pockets and cleans them, uh, but then there is no uh, sustained benefit here over time. So somewhat inconsistent results, if you like, with these biomarkers. I move on a bit quicker here now because we're uh, running out of time, I notice. Uh, so the American Heart Association issued this scientific statement back in uh, 2012, and what did they say? Well, they said observational studies to date support an association between uh, peritoneal disease and these uh, atherosclerotic vascular diseases, independent of known confounders. They do not, however, support a causative relationship, um, uh, uh, even though uh, these interventions for peritoneal treatment results in reductions in uh, systemic inflammation and the theory of dysfunction in short-term studies, there is no evidence that they prevent uh, the disease, a cardiovascular disease that is, or modify its outcomes. So, and the problem is what they want is they want heart, they want trials, and they want um, randomized trials. I'm running out of time here, so I need to be very quick with this. Pregnancy trials, it's been trialed in pregnancy. Why? Because uh, pregnancy uh, you have a result after nine months. You don't need to wait for a long time. You get hard endpoints with pregnancy outcomes within nine months. Ideal. Um, uh, and so in this, there were two large NIH-funded trials uh, in the U.S. where they, uh, you know, did very, very intensive uh, periodontal treatment uh, to patients um, that were, and I will show you what the problem is, but effectively no result. I mean, no effect of periodontal treatment. So a very disappointing outcome here in the first trial and then in the motor trial, which was very similar. Again, uh, very similar outcomes. In this case, if anything, the treatment group had uh, slightly worse outcomes than the control group. Now, what was the problem with these trials? I, I tell you this very quickly. Well, the mean age is 25 years and not surprising because these were pregnant women and um, there is not a lot of periodontal disease around in, uh, in this age group, right? Periodontitis develops typically uh, when you know, you're older than 30, typically around 40 is sort of the peak incidence. So you, know, you have to question whether these patients here 
uh, or but at least pregnant women, um, really did suffer from significant severe periodontal disease. The picture looks a little bit more hopeful in the, in the, uh, when it comes to diabetes. Um, uh, the, the theory here is that, the, that infections in general uh, really increase diabetes, uh, the insulin resistance, which is the, the causative factor or, of uh, type 2 diabetes. And so here, this is a Cochrane review, systematic review of 14 randomized controlled trials. Uh, and they say, well, they say there's low quality evidence from 14 studies um, that uh, when we compare periodontal therapy with no active intervention or usual care, uh, that that then results in a 0.3% lower glycated hemoglobin level, uh, which is the, the, the biomarker that really uh, is uh, well generally accepted to be the most meaningful marker uh, uh, to uh, monitor diabetic control. Uh, so that uh, treatment really results in this 0.3% lower level, three to four months post treatment. But then after six months, they couldn't see only five studies. They couldn't see any effect uh, on um, on the HbA1c levels. Uh, however, again, the problem is that the picture isn't consistent necessarily. This is the largest study of its kind, NIH funded, very expensive, many million uh, dollars. Uh, spent on this over 500 patients randomized in, 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 in multiple centers in the US. And uh, the result was a null result, no effect. The study was heavily criticized for various uh, issues methodologically, but nonetheless, this is clearly one of those studies that uh, uh, were done in a very robust way. And finally, I'm gonna share with you uh, recent results from London again. Um, uh, Professor uh, Francesco D'Aiuto here published this uh, just a year and a half ago, roughly. Um, and they did, uh, again, randomized here over 260 patients that this time had fairly severe periodontitis. And they did something that uh, uh, not many other studies had done, uh, which is they offered them also surgery, which is a more radical way of eliminating uh, the periodontal infection and then maintained them over time. And they had a, a control group here that simply got a tooth cleaning and was monitored over a year. And what did they find? Well, rather, um, so first of all, the periodontal parameters improved, uh, but the, um, the interesting slide is this one here. So on the left side, you see this HbA1c again. This is uh, you know, what diabetologists and, and the type two di I mean, diabetes patients are very familiar with this measure. Um, uh, and what you can see here is at baseline, obviously these are comparable because it's randomized. And then over time, those in the intervention group uh, do much better here and significantly so after 12 months than the uh, control group. And again, they did this functional assessment of the vascular function uh, and they show a benefit in the intervention group at six and 12 months. Uh, so that's encouraging, um, but overall, uh, I close here with this guest editorial that was published uh, back just again two years ago in the Journal of the American Dental Association. Here is uh, my former boss, Raul Garcia, again, um, who coined that uh, floss or die phrase. And well, the title says it all, if you like, promoting oral health care because of its possible effect on systemic diseases, premature and maybe misleading. Ultimately, what they say is, why is it not enough to just help people maintain good oral health? and keep their teeth. Thank you very much. We are, I took a bit longer, I think, than I should have taken. I apologize for that. And um, we have Q&A. And there was one question, perhaps, that I can answer straight away, which was uh, uh, three or four uh, people had asked kind of the same thing, which is, uh, can you do too much flossing? Uh, and the short answer is yes. <laughs> there is, um, there is uh, uh, some evidence, or at least you can do it wrongly, let's put it that way. So um, if you don't do it correctly, you, do, can, you can harm yourself. So there are plenty of examples in the literature documented that you, know, you can have side effects. So the important thing about your flossing is you should certainly uh, have your uh, hygienist or dentist check that you do it correctly. Flossing, has become, has been a little bit, uh, had a bit of bad press uh, over the recent years. Um, people or some studies have sort of raised some doubts uh, with regards to its effectiveness and so forth. 
I would say that it is, uh, if you do it correctly, it can be very effective, but it's a bit tricky. And so you need to make sure that you do it correctly and please check that with your hygienist and your dentist. Another question I think related, once you have periodontitis, uh, you know, what else can you do uh, in, in addition to flossing? The first thing there is again, uh, uh, you know, consult your dentist and your hygienist because flossing is rarely appropriate if you actually do have periodontitis. So there are other means of interdental uh, cleaning that are probably more suitable for you if you have indeed uh, periodontitis. Um, I'm not sure how, if, I mean, I, I, I'm not in a rush. If we can stay on for longer, that's fine. And I'm happy to answer more questions. I think um, in the interest of time, uh, we may just be able to take one question. Um, so, uh, Stefan. Yes, uh, so we've got um, one, one or two minutes potentially. Um, um, one of the questions from the chat was about um, gingivitis and could patients who are susceptible for gingivitis but without having any bone loss or attachment loss, could uh, that gingivitis still affect systemic disease? Well, maybe. So, I mean, the evidence is not particularly strong for that, but um, um, I mean, the same, the same um, caveat, the same caveat apply to gingivitis, in some terms even more so because um, gingivitis really you do need to assess clinically. Um, it is a very volatile condition, as um, as you know. So it can, you know, you can have some gingivitis one day, you don't have it the next day. So um, assessing that in, the, in, in, in longitudinal long-term studies is is very challenging. So um, I think I would say it's less plausible um, uh, than the peri hypothesis, but I can't rule it out. There is uh, no evidence, uh, uh, you know, to, that rules it out clearly. Um, so yeah, that will be my answer um, in terms of gingivitis. The other interesting thing about gingivitis is, I mean, you, you have some paradox effects. So smoking, for example, uh, smokers exhibit very little gingivitis clinically, but smoking is a very strong risk factor, the strongest we know for periodontitis. Um, and so, yeah, gingivitis is a, is a, funny, uh, is a funny beast. Thank you. Great. Yes, um, so I'm very sorry. I do think that we, um, we should wrap up. Um, thank you so much for the informative presentation. Um, a lot of very good, um, shocking graphics, and it was very humorous. Um, you know, really appreciate it. Uh, I can think, I, you know, I we have a lot of questions. Yeah. Can I just say I'm happy because, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of, uh, of, of uh, overrunning a little bit. So I'm happy to take any questions via email, um, you know, and, and uh, I'll, I'll respond to that. There were also some more uh, questions more of a more personal nature I saw uh, 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 looking for career advice and I'm happy to to answer those as well but please uh, email me directly <laughs> yeah brilliant yeah I was going to suggest that I mean um, yeah I, I really really appreciate you know the uh, personable approach because I mean we do have a lot of good questions so um, we made a note of everything and we'll submit those questions um, to uh, Thomas via email and he'll answer them uh, yeah and um, well we the Harbour Club really enjoys collaborating with our graduate schools and we, we look forward to the next event with the um, Harvard School, C.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you very much for coming. Till next time.